Ari Herstan, welcome to Australian Musician. Thank you so much. Good to be here. Uh, we'll be talking soon about uh, something really helpful for emerging artists, the Fender Artist Playbook. But before we get into that, uh, I wonder if you could just tell us briefly about your own journey into the performing and recording world. Sure. Um, so I, I, I uh, went to school initially for, uh, I went to a university for uh, classical trumpet and music education. I thought I was going to be a high school music teacher. I realized very quickly that my passion uh, lies in songwriting and performing my original music. So I quickly uh, realized that and transferred to music industry school in um, Minnesota in the States uh, where I live. And, and I studied music business songwriting, but got in and out pretty quick and realized that everything that I was taught at this music school, music business um, in 2000 five or so was uh, pretty outdated as the history, uh, as where the music industry was at in 2005. Uh, nobody really knew what was happening. So I realized everything that I had learned was totally outdated um, and uh, not relevant at all when I was starting my music career. Um, and I, you know, at 18 and I was, uh, lear I, I was taught that what I needed was a, was a, a record deal right away um, because that was the only way that I was taught that you could make it in music. So I quickly realized that just sitting around waiting for this record deal to land in my lap, like they told me that's what happened. Because the thinking at the time was, you need a record deal to make a music career happen, but nobody told you how to get a record deal. They're just like, this is what you need, good luck. <laughs> like, wait, what? <laughs> so I was like, well, I guess I have two options. Um, I can sit around and keep waiting for this record deal to, to magically appear because I was told by everybody and in, in all the books that you cannot have a music career unless you get a record deal. Or option two was, I love performing. I love making music. Let me just see if I can figure all this out on my own without the permission of these powers that be. I chose the second option and I then started just learning by doing everything. So I, um, you know, I started booking shows and realized, all right, why didn't anybody show up to my show? And I was like, ah, I didn't tell anyone. I didn't promote it. First lesson learned, you have to promote your shows if you want people to show up. So uh, there was just lesson after lesson. And I uh, fast forward a few years and I started selling out venues all over the country. I was getting songs placed on TV shows uh, and commercials and movies. I was charting on iTunes um, and I, uh, you know, was kind of doing this all without the support of the traditional music industry. And uh, I'm a guitar player. I'm a piano player. I'm a singer songwriter. I also play a little bit of trumpet as you know. Um, and yeah, so I was kind of doing the, the one man show for a while. I uh, perform with other musicians. Um, I would have bands and, uh, and then, you know, fast forward, um, to a bit where I was hit up by a bunch of musicians saying, Hey, how are you doing all this by yourself on your own? And, uh, who's your manager? Who's your booking agent? Who's your record label? I'm like, I, I, I don't have anyone. I'm just doing it. I'm figuring it out. And so I started just sharing all the info I was learning with everybody. And then word spread. If you have questions about the music business, go ask Ari. And eventually I was like, oh my gosh, I don't have any time to get back to everybody. But I want to share the information with everyone. So I launched the blog Ari's Take and just started sharing everything I was learning and then came out with a book, How to Make It in the New Music Business. And then that's been my mission ever since. Just share everything I know. Yeah, um, and you've even got a, an online music school. You've taken it to, to that degree. Um, Truth. With all of these projects, you speak to uh, uh, emerging artists and, and established artists uh, with your podcast. Uh, what are the recurring themes that keep coming up in these conversations? Mm -hmm. um, so I, on my podcast, on the New Music Business podcast, I uh, the final question I ask everybody is, what does it mean to you to make it in the new music business? And I have interviewed everyone from Grammy winning, uh, award, Grammy winning award artists to managers, to music supervisors, uh, booking agents, uh, you name it. Uh, I've, I've probably interviewed someone in that category. 
And the recurring theme, the recurring thing that I keep hearing over and over and over again is making it just means making a living doing what you love. It's really simple. And I think a lot of younger musicians, uh, especially get clouded by the glitz and glamour and the fame that goes around and, and they see some of their idols and, and they think that making it is that, but they can't actually identify what that is because their, their favorite artist, someone may never have heard of. And so it's kind of this elusive thing of like, well, what is actually making it mean? And when you really break it down, when you are in it long enough and understand that there's lots of highs and lots of lows and everything in between and ups and downs, and there's no clear pathway to success anymore, making it is just survival. Making it is just doing what you love and making a living at it. And that's it. And having the freedom to do that. So I, I, you know, would encourage everyone out there to reevaluate what their definition of success means, because I think we have been uh, trained and influenced by previous generations and of what the music industry used to look like and what it took to quote unquote, make it then, uh, which is wildly different than what it is today. And uh, I, I would encourage everybody to really just think about what do you want for your life? Not just your career, but what kind of life do you want to have? And then can you achieve that kind of life doing something you love, doing music? And if so, then you could break that down even further and identify what some of your goals are of how you want to achieve that and then structure your life for that. There is this idea that you need to follow this traditional trajectory and get signed and go on tour and go on the radio. And it's all outdated and antiquated. And everyone I've spoke to that is successful now realizes that and they have redefined what success means. Yeah. Uh, Fender has recognized that you know a thing or two about the music business. Uh, and in conjunction with Fender, you, you guys have come up with this Fender Artist Playbook, which is out on mm -hmm. July 29, uh, a guide to the modern music uh, world for aspiring musicians. Um, what do you hope to achieve or what does Fender and yourself hope to achieve with this book? Right. So, um, you know, I, I'm a musician myself. I, I played three shows this last weekend um, in LA, uh, all out, outdoors. Um, <laughs> they were safe. Don't worry, everyone. Um, but, uh, but, you know, I, I'm still an active musician. I release music regularly. I perform regularly. Um, I understand. I'm an independent DIY musician. I understand what it takes to run a successful music career. I'm doing it myself. Um, but the thing is, is that because I have this platform, because I run Ari's Take, and because, uh, yes, like you mentioned, uh, Ari's Take Academy, and I have this network, but I also have a book. Um, I'm in this unique position where I'm able to sit down with virtually anyone in the music industry I'd like to and ask them the questions that every musician has that maybe they don't get to ask them. So I've learned a lot and I have interviewed hundreds of, of movers and shakers in the music industry, top to bottom, left to right. And um, I, it's become my lifelong mission now to empower the music community and lift everybody up. I don't believe in competition in the music industry. I believe that a rising tide lifts all ships. And I don't want to see any hardworking, talented, passionate musician not be able to make a music career happen because they don't have the information and they don't have the resources or know-how because they just haven't been uh, informed. So with this playbook, with the Fender Artist Playbook that we have collaborated on and I wrote, I am just looking to share the most current, up-to-date, useful information that artists can use for right now, right now, 2021, uh, where we are in the industry. We had a very quick turnaround this. I just finished like the last sentence, like just a few days ago and boom, they put it out. So it is very up to date. Um, and it is kind of a snapshot of where the industry is right now and where musicians should be. And yes, of course, the music industry moves very quickly. Um, but it's also, um, it's also the, the part of this is to, refocus your mindset on what it takes to run a successful music career and really break it down 
to very, very specific actionable items. I mean, we have a 15 uh, piece checklist, an album release checklist, 15 items, check them off. Just do this, check, do this, check. You know, like that's the kind of stuff that I need when I'm releasing a song. It's like, wait, did I forget to do this? What am I supposed to do next? Oh, I totally forgot to do that. Man, I wish there was a checklist out there. So now we have a checklist. <laughs> and, um, but also, you know, I talk a lot about how to set actionable, smart goals, which is a huge thing that catches up so many musicians right now um, of every age of whether you're just starting off or you're 50 years into a music career, you need to set goals and you need to set smart goals and smart stands for specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, time bound. You can't just say, I want a music career. That's my goal. It's like, no, you need a specific goal. You need a smart goal. You need a goal that, what am I going to achieve in six months? I want to sell out this music venue in six months. That's a smart goal. I want to make a bunch of money doing music. That's not a smart goal because how do you measure that? So I break all that down and discuss, okay, this is how you can set up these goals and then knock them down. I guess in this online world during pandemic, the audience has never been bigger. So the opportunity uh, has never been bigger for, for musicians. Uh, and the flip side of that is that there's never been as many musicians uh, mm -hmm. online. Um, True. For someone just starting out, where do you even begin? Right. I mean, that's a that's a very good point, and it's very accurate. I mean, Spotify officially came out uh, in February and said that there are sixty thousand songs uploaded to Spotify every single day. That pro that number is probably much higher than that. DistroKid just came out uh, a month ago and said that they distribute thirty five thousand songs every single day uh, to Spotify and everywhere else. So. Yes, there is a lot of noise. And so it's kind of, how do you break through that noise? Um, again, I'm going to take it right back and I'm going to sound like a broken record because it is the most important thing that everyone can possibly do. Identify your goals. Because here's the thing. There are literally as many ways to make a music career happen today as there are musicians. There is no one way to make a music career happen anymore. Sure, 20 years ago, there was one way. You get signed, you go on tour, you hope you get on the radio, you hope you sell a boatload of records. That was pretty much the trajectory of most music careers. And that was pretty much what you're supposed to do. It was pretty clear cut. It was pretty much a straight line. It's like, yeah, you get signed. Of course, only 98% uh, of 98% uh, of all the artists that got signed to major labels failed and only 2% succeeded. And that was just kind of how it worked. Um, but nowadays, you don't need a record label. You don't, uh, the independent artists are gaining market share every day. Uh, independent artists right now have about 35% of the global music market share. This was a study that was just released by Media Research. Um, and DIY self-distributed artists in 2020 made $1.2 billion in revenue. $1.2 billion in 2020. That's the highest it's ever been. We're talking the self-distributed DIY artists. Independent artists are taking over and don't need the major labels anymore to just run a successful music career. But yes, you can do it. Absolutely. But what do you do? How do you do it? What are you supposed to know to do? That's the thing. Why goals are so important? Because if somebody comes to me and says, what, what am I supposed to do? Or I have this album. What, what should I do? I'm like, I have no idea because I don't know who you are. I don't know what you like, what you dislike, what you want, what you're good at, what your strengths are, what your weaknesses are. So like, if they say, I just want to make music from home uh, and I don't want to tour, I don't want to play live, I, I hate performing. If I said, oh, you need to go on tour, that's how you have to do it. It's like, that's the worst piece of advice I could give them. And that is the wrong piece of advice because they don't want to tour. So why tell someone who doesn't want to tour to tour? That's absurd. But similarly, if they're like, I only want to play live and I hate TikTok. If I think about TikTok, I'm going to, I'm going to vomit. Uh, I'm not going to say you have to get on TikTok and you got to master your TikTok game because like that's not useful advice. There are so many different ways to make a music career happen. And yeah, TikTok is all the conversation, all the rage right now. And yeah, we're seeing some success stories from TikTok, but we're also seeing su success stories in every other realm of the music industry right now as well. So there isn't just one way to make it. So you have to know what you want and what you like and what you dislike. And that's how you make your goals. If you despise TikTok and want nothing to do with it, don't make your goal, I want to be big on TikTok. <laughs> or don't make your goal, I want to build my music career with TikTok. But similarly, 
if you get it and you love it and that makes a lot of sense to you and you're really inspired by it, then sure, you could say, yeah, my goal, my smart goal is in six months, I wanna have 1 million total likes on TikTok and I want to, I want that to have generated uh, 2 million total streams on Spotify because of TikTok. I'm like, okay, if that's your goal, I bet you could achieve it because then you're working every single day, working to master your TikTok game. And it, it takes a lot of trying and failing to master anything. And the thing that catches most musicians up and where everybody gets caught up is they think they, they try something once, it doesn't work. So they say, it doesn't work. It didn't work for me. That's all. TikTok doesn't work. Live streaming doesn't work. Live, you know, internet doesn't work for me. It's like, okay, hold on. If you just tried it once, you're going to fail. Nobody magically has something happen and work the first time they try it. But if your goal was, I want to achieve this and in six months, and I know exactly it's measurable. I know what I want. You reverse engineer that. You're like, okay, how am I actually going to get to that goal? So if let's say your goal was, I wanted to get a song on a TV show in six months. It's like, okay, that's my goal. Now, how am I going to achieve that? Let's reverse engineer that. All right. Which TV show? Clearly, some TV shows, if, if I'm a singer-songwriter with acoustic music, I'm not going to contact the TV shows that only play hip-hop. So it's like, okay, now I'm figuring this out. All right, now I have my list of TV shows. Great. These five TV shows all play music like mine. All right, now how do I get music to them? Oh, there's a person called a music supervisor. Ah, they're the ones who place the music in that. Who are they? What are their names? What's their email? How do I get in touch with them? How do they? That's the reverse engineering part. These are all the steps that you have to take no matter what your goal is. And you just march down that road to achieve that goal. But if you're just like, I want to get a song at a TV show. And you're like, all right, well, I'm going to send one email to the head of the network of that TV show. And it was like, they didn't respond to me. So I guess that's not going to happen. It's like, of course, that's not going to work. But that's like, it sounds absurd. But like, that's what people do. They like, get on Twitch one time. I want to live stream on Twitch. I've heard so much about Twitch. They, they get on Twitch. Nobody shows up. Like, well, Twitch doesn't work. It sucks. It's like, okay, <laughs> you got to work at it. This is like, I can't hand you a guitar and expect you to start shredding like Jimi Hendrix right now. You got to master it. You got to work at it. Just like you have to work at your instrument. You also have to work at the business side of music. Yeah. Uh, during the pandemic, a lot of musicians have got very innovative. Uh, what are some examples that you've seen that uh, have impressed you? Sure. Um, so live streaming has become a big one. Uh, you know, like I just mentioned with Twitch, um, before the pandemic, Twitch was primarily just used by gamers. Um, over the pandemic, during the pandemic, live streaming exploded. Uh, you know, prior to the pandemic, there was really just one ticketed live stream platform and that was stage it and now there's tons and right when the pandemic started when uh, lockdown happened and all tours got canceled um, I actually launched and founded the uncanceled music festival I partnered with Fender on that one again and uh, we put on around a thousand shows uh, of, of live stream ticketed concerts online and that's something that has really took off so whereas before there wasn't really that functionality to be able to run ticketed live stream concerts, now there is. Now there's so many platforms. So if you have a big fan base um, and an engaged fan base, you can run ticketed live streams. And what we're seeing is hybrid concerts now. Now that concerts are starting to come back in some countries, some cities, uh, a lot of the venues have outfitted themselves with live streaming capabilities so they can charge tickets for the live stream version. They can also charge tickets for the in-person version. So that is gonna continue post pandemic. Um, back to Twitch, uh, this live stream platform, it's, it's the um, most popular live stream platform right now. Um, and there are millions of people on Twitch at any moment that you sign on to that. Um, and it is uh, great monetization capabilities. Uh, so I had the head of music at Twitch on the new music business podcast on my podcast. And he revealed to me the startling statistic that the musicians who are making over $50,000 on Twitch are doing so from just 183 fans. 183, not 183 million. It's not Spotify, not 183,000. Not, literally 183 people is how you can make $50,000 on Twitch. So 
that's that's something that I think a lot of people don't realize is that like, all right, yeah, we're in this 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 realm where it's all about the macro numbers and it's and it's it's crazy because it's like, oh, you need millions of millions of streams to make thousands of dollars, just you know, but that's not true everywhere. And so I think live streaming was something that people were using in really innovative ways, not just to build their fan base, which they did, but also to make some revenue too. Yeah. What are some of the biggest errors that you see artists make with their social media? Um, I think that some big ones are that uh, a lot of it is not well thought out. So Instagram, for instance, that's kind of the new website. That's the new calling card. If I go to your Instagram, I should get a pretty good example, a pretty good idea of who you are in vibe, taste, tone. It's the essence of what your music project is about. If your Instagram only has a bunch of posts about inside jokes with you and your friends and, and the food that you're eating last night, like I'm not going to understand what your project is all about or who you are. So if you want, you need a, you need, you need an aesthetic and a vibe and an essence that matches the tone and vibe of who you are as an artist and your music. So it's the hardest thing for artists, this creative direction, creative design, um, to match your aesthetics to your music. But, but that's the thing that separates artists with a capital A that fans will follow for life and artists with a lowercase a that are just really musicians that are not quite artists yet because they don't really know what they're saying or how to say it. And just because you can write a great song doesn't mean anything. People don't fall in love with artists because of one good song. They might fall in love with the song, but they fall in love with artists and they follow artists and become fans of artists because of who that artist is, what they stand for, what they're saying. And they need to be invited into that artist project oftentimes through their Instagram and by getting to know them, but understanding who they are because they have a very clear uh, aesthetic, but also clear vision because it's not just about what do I look like? That's not what aesthetic is. It's what is the vision for my project and what am I trying to communicate to the world? And so that's really important for every artist to identify is just like, who am I? What am I trying to say? And how can I say that through this medium of Instagram right now um, or TikTok or any of that? So it's uh, important to really think about that. And you can't run your Instagram today like you ran your Facebook five years ago. It's a different platform and a different medium. Similarly, you can't run TikTok like you run your Instagram. It's a very different thing. So you have to understand the platform and what is the etiquette on the platform? What are, how are people succeeding on that platform? And become a member of that community because that platform has a community, even though it might be hundreds of millions of people, you still got to understand the etiquette. And then really realize, okay, where are your fans? Where do they exist? And identifying, you know, who your fan base is and where are they hanging out online? And go there. And if you have a teenage fan base, a college age fan base, yeah, TikTok. You got to, you, if, if, if you want to reach that audience and TikTok inspires you, then you can use TikTok and that can focus your efforts. Now, if your audience is 50 plus, head on over to Facebook, focus a lot of your attention, Facebook and YouTube. If your audience is kind of somewhere in between, you know, uh, hybrid of, Instagram, YouTube, TikTok, that kind of a thing. Um, but across the board, currently as it stands right now, Instagram is kind of the the um, the new website and that is the, the home base for pretty much everyone right now. Yeah. Um, I've always believed that the recorded music industry has never really fully utilized a relationship with the musical instrument industry. They've been like these parallel worlds all along. Um, how significant is it that a company like Fender is getting involved with their, their Fender Next program and, and things like this playbook. Yeah, um, so full disclosure, I'm not an employee of Fender. Uh, I'm not even really uh, super connected with them. We're just fans of each other. We partnered on this project together. Um, you know, I love Fender and, uh, I, and I really appreciate what they're doing for the artist community right now. And so when they approached me to write this playbook for them. I thought this was a perfect partnership. Um, so as you know, they're not 
you know, I, I'm, I'm not an employee of them, so I can say whatever I want <laughs> for the most part. Um, but I think they're doing really great work. And I, and, and to be honest, like, you know, Fender is such a well-respected brand. Um, and you know, a, a bunch of my guitars are Fender. I have a telly right there. Um, and uh, I, but I always have a telly right there. It's not because I'm doing a thing about Fender right now. It's just like, <laughs> I just own Fender. Who doesn't own Fender guitars? Um, so I, I appreciate when I see any company in the industry um, that is focusing on their customer base and their client base uh, and looking how they can be of service and support them. And that's where we align because it's not just how can I hawk more guitars? How can I sell them more shit, you know? And how can I make more money? What? It's not about that. Like, you know, this Fender Playbook we put together is free. They're giving it away because it's a resource um, and they realize that this is super valuable for uh, for their audience, which are who are musicians and musicians. They want they want them to succeed. Like it doesn't really make Fender. It doesn't make a difference to Fender's bottom line. If somebody buys a guitar and makes a million dollars from the music that they create on the guitar or if somebody buys a guitar and makes zero dollars from that guitar. But, you know, they're still making that money on that guitar. But. They understand, you know, this is, uh, we want to see our audience succeed. We want to see more of our uh, musicians uh, finding pathways to sustainability and success. And I think that's a really uh, wonderful, beautiful thing that we are aligned on. Yeah. Um, one of the biggest issues for musicians who interact with other artists remotely is lag time. Um, when the pandemic started I, I saw uh uh tel winkerfeld and orianthi trying to do a a live jam on instagram and, and the lag time just it wasn't happening but uh it was very casual and it was very amusing I, I guess it's only a matter of time before uh technology fixes that issue do you see any leaders in that field coming up Oh, gosh. Um, well, I made a record uh, over quarantine with my producer and uh, we, um, you know, my producer lived 15 minutes down the road, but we didn't see each other really ever. We were recording from our respective studios and uh, we were able to do this because of um, Audio Movers, which is uh, a program that it's it's uh, it's a plug in for most DAWs, Pro Tools, Logic, I believe Ableton, some others we were using Pro Tools and Logic. Um, and through Zoom and Audio Movers, uh, we were able to record in real time. He was able to take over my screen and track me while I was doing vocals and playing guitar. And he was able to track it and we could communicate and we could talk. And similarly, when he hopped on the drums, I was able to like in real time, listen to the full session with my headphones at home virtually in real time the lag time you know we weren't playing at the same time so we weren't trying to jam I, nobody's there yet um I, I don't you know i don't know how long how far away we are for that but we weren't jamming necessarily we were just recording so yeah there might have been a, a second or two delay or something like that but that didn't matter as much because i mean it was actually probably shorter than that uh, maybe a half a second delay um but I was able to, when he's like playing and, and we hit the bridge, I could like yell, like, go to the ride. And he then like would go to the ride and and play it. And, and you know, where it was essentially like I was in the control booth. So it, that was pretty cool. Um, you know, but other other platforms are starting to do that and experiment. Um, I've only used audio movers because we used it for my record, but I know some others are, are doing that as well. And um, I know Pro Tools and others have integrations with Dropbox and, you know, you can save your files to the cloud and you can collaborate on tracks. So I think in the recording realm, we're a lot further than the live performance jamming realm. Um, but, uh, you know, but nothing beats being in a room with other people and, and playing music. So uh, I can't wait, you know, to get back to, to doing that again. Yeah. Uh, there's no guarantee that the pandemic is going to be over anytime soon. Um, and in fact, the effects may last for years and the music business may never be the same again. Um, for artists who don't embrace technology and social media, um, is there any chance for them? Sure. Um, absolutely. I mean, we artists are creative people and creative individuals. And it's, it's funny that you you link uh, kind of 
social media and and just like don't embrace the internet and social media or whatever uh all in one because like you know i there are even just using uh, like the internet is this massive wild thing that uh there are literally thousands of ways to reach an audience through the internet that oftentimes don't necessarily just have to do with social media uh you can get creative um you know uh, my, uh, my fiance, she's a, a musician herself, uh, Annabelle Lee. She's a fantastic musician. She just ran an art auction, uh, using, you know, an online silent art auction. She's also a visual artist, but, uh, the winners of that silent art auction, they got tickets to her performance, to her concert, to, to, um, to that. And the only way to get tickets was you bid on her art at the artwork. So like, that's a creative endeavor that's like no one else is doing that i mean for one how many like you know musicians are also visual artists and selling their art but but it's like get creative with you ways that you can approach this and and i think we saw a lot of artists getting really creative over the pandemic but yeah you're right uh the music industry is never going to be the same so like there you really i think have two options and one is bitch and moan about how nothing's the same and then sit in one spot and kind of just wither away and, and have no career to speak of and reach absolutely no one, or you can make it happen. <laughs> so it's like, it's really simple. It's like, are you going to bitch and moan? Or are you going to make it happen? It's really just two options. So like, you want to make it happen. You're going to make it happen. You're going to figure it out. If you don't really care to make it happen, then, Okay, nothing I can do for you. <laughs> I'm sorry. So what's next for Ari Hurstan? So I am in the midst of uh, performing with this new immersive funk show that I'm doing. Uh, my, my funk band, Brass Roots District, uh, we have created an immersive theatrical concert experience. Right now we're doing it out, outside. And fortunately in LA at least, we can perform concerts outside. Um, and we've done uh, three weekends of shows so far. We have more coming up. It is a, kind of a combination of a concert and a theatrical experience, and that's something I'm really focusing on right now, having a lot of fun with, um, and I am also uh, heavy in the New Music Business podcast. We release an episode um, most most weeks, so the New Music Business podcast, I'm interviewing. I just in, interviewed Imogen Heap. That episode will be up um, any day now. And uh, that's a really excellent episode. She, we talk all about the future of music. We get into NFTs and we talk about the technology and artist advocacy and, and how you can streamline artist royalties. And, and so that's, I would encourage everyone to check out that episode. Um, and then, yeah, Ari's Take Academy. I have over 3,000 students that's part of this online uh, learning institution where artists are learning everything from digital marketing to sync licensing to live streaming. Um, and so that's something that, you know, I'm, I'm always looking on ways that I can support the artist community. And so any, any way that I, I see that I can be of service to musicians out there, I'm, I'm all for. Well, Ari, it's been great to catch up and uh, I'm sure a lot of our followers will uh, find a lot of what you said very valuable and uh, they should get Thank the Fender Artist playbook as well. So uh, thanks for joining us. Thank you so much.